You're on. <laughs> the ground has been light. I thought I interrupted something here. Well, in case somebody hasn't done it already, welcome to White House. <laughs> hey, uh, I've, I don't know how far you've gone on tax reform, but that was the reason for asking you all to come here. The question is, is what, you, do you want to go to 50% or not? <laughs> Go to 50 percent. You like a top rate of 40 percent? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if you haven't given them already those basic figures about the extent of the tax cut for the various groups in the top sector, well, the bottom gets almost 19 percent in cuts. The next group gets uh, about seven and a half percent, and that top group only gets around five percent. So I think that it has graduated appropriately. And if no one has told you, I, uh, I did some pen and ink myself the other day. We were making a speech someplace in, in, in New Jersey, I think it was, and in that particular area, we'd taken a specific case of a middle income person, someone in the low $40,000 range, and what their tax burden would be under our plan. And I just got curious, and I multiplied it by 10 and decided to see someone with 10 times that earnings, the size income, what their tax uh, burden would be. So now they're earning 10 times as much as the other family. They'd be paying 30 times as much tax under the new plan. So I think our tax system is still progressive, progressive enough. More than I need to. <laughs> I'm worried about plowing ground you've already plowed. We, um, I know that uh, when we last met in January, we had a frank discussion which was extremely helpful in our efforts to fashion a proposal which achieved needed reform, which legislatively realistic. And uh, since unveiling that, I've traveled to a number of places throughout the country. And I have been amazed because my principal subject was this. And uh, a couple of those stops were actually in uh, industry plants where I was talking to rank and file union labor and the reception was no different than it was any place else. It was a roaring approval of everything that we had to say about the, uh, the tax reform. So the, I think they really wanted and it's across the board out there in wanting it. The, uh, I think it's a historic opportunity for us to do something that uh, we've talked about so many times. Good Lord, I've been reading some things and uh, I think it was said by some of your colleagues back, uh, whether they're still colleagues or retired, but back more than 10 years ago. And the subject then of tax reform would be discussed, but it was kind of wishful thinking, that as if there was no chance that such a thing could ever happen, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could? Yes. Republican members of the House Ways and Means Committee, I'm counting on your help and support for the enactment of, of such legislation as we're talking about. Though this is a bipartisan effort, I think it's vital <coughs> to achieve solid Republican support. I realize that many of you have problems with specific provisions, and maybe you've discussed all of those already. But, and this is to be expected in any comprehensive review of our tax code, but I'd like to ask you to keep your options open and look at the whole package and not just at a particular spot here and there. There'll be ample opportunity during the legislative process and we're committed to working within the process to address any problem areas. <clears throat> there is and will continue to be, I think, intense pressure from special interests to emasculate this package. And that could be done by picking a thing here and a thing there and forgetting to weigh up and see, uh, even in some of the most controversial things, see is the individual, even if we, for example, take away that deduction, is the individual still going to be better off? And I think in every instance you find that they are. So meaningful reform only be achieved if we can withstand this pressure and work for the only special interest that counts, and that's the public interest It'll be a difficult task, but I know those members of the Ways and Means Committee are accustomed to dealing with difficult tasks, and we can't allow this moment to slip by. 
together we can make a tax reform a reality. We need all of your help. And golly, if you need any reassurance, just talk to my friend Roski. You heard me. <laughs> no, but uh, now, I know uh, that you must have been in a discussion with questions and so forth. Can I make a, a comment, Mr. President? As we discussed yesterday when the leadership was down here, we talked about the, the, uh, the uh, importance that delay could play with respect to tax reform and how the biggest enemy of tax reform, in our opinion right now, would be delay. And we've had a, we've had a, a, a wide ranging discussion here, and frank discussion, quite frankly, of the importance of making sure that there's, there's full and complete hearings and an opportunity to assess the effects of these changes because these are significant changes we're talking about over, overhauling the entire tax code. But uh, maybe the maybe the members would be would be uh, pleased to hear your views on when you'd like to see this done or the importance of getting it done and that sort of thing. I I've told them what I think, but I think <clears throat> I'd like to see it go into effect as of January first, and I would think that all of you who are going to be in election year beginning January first would prefer it that way rather than what I think Tip's dream is, and that is that this is still an issue on which they can campaign and take advantage of things as they did in the Social Security matter in 1982. And he has even kind of carelessly expressed uh, something that indicates that I'm not dreaming this up. But I think to, uh, for us to go into that and having accomplished and having done this, I think would be riding the crest of a wave that would have to be to our advantage. I'd like to see it done this year and make it start at the beginning of the year. Imagine all those people out there who suddenly, as of January 1st, look at their situation and say, hey, uh, I may not even have to fill out a form. I don't owe any tax. I'm not going to owe any tax at all. Uh, well, Mr. President, we, uh, uh, you make a good case out there when you speak in generic terms. I think if I go on that speaking stump out there, the same thing. You can get a good reaction when you talk in, in these generic terms about tax reform and tax simplification <coughs> in the polls. Absolutely. We're all for it. These are the guys, however, that got to work with the specifics. It's always one thing to talk in generic terms, another thing to talk about specifics. And now, the more those hearings go on and the individual little items and sensitivities come up, these are the ones that cause the most perplexing problem for us. And I guess I've communicated to some of your folks too, and coming from an industrial section like I do, you know, the average person out there isn't all that hep about having his taxes reduced as he is making sure he's got a job. And in heavy industry area, if they see their job waning and uh, their taxes reduced, uh, well, they want to be able to pay taxes, but they got to have a job to pay taxes. Some of our areas are still plagued with severe unemployment and heavy industries. You know, there's nothing in this tax bill that heavy industry gets a big, big charge on it because what we gave them in '81, we take away in '85, and then we even recapture beyond that. And you're going to find those that temp that uh, those questions arriving and uh, coming up on a more frequent basis. And I think we've got to be prepared to answer those. I'm, we, we're in house now. We can talk very frankly, but we have to do that. Otherwise, we're not going to make the best image when we get out there. And yeah, yeah. Bob, the uh, Bethlehem Steel <coughs> is supportive of this, actively supportive. General Motors is. Uh, uh, Dark Craft is. This is a kind of a cross section of some of those industries. And they have all looked and are heavily supportive of it. The one that's caused so much the reduction of local and state taxes, well, California is one of the high, uh, high taxing states, has an income tax with a top bracket of 11 percent. And uh, the polls show that in California, they're not really for it, but also, I think we've taken some examples there and proven that people get a tax cut. I'm quite interested in this because that's where I pay my taxes. Uh, but that. Uh, even so, even with that high tax, you're going to get a tax cut. Mr. President, uh, we don't want you to think that, that the bill, if, if it doesn't come out on the date that you wish, that, that there's any member of, 
Republic of Member of the Ways and Means is trying to, to delay anything, but I think we are looking at reality that in the committee, if you look back at the history of, of tax reform and nothing compared with this tax reform, it just doesn't quite move that fast. The, the last big big bill we had 81, it took over over a year, and that was near as, as large as this one, and near as comprehensive. Uh, we, you can read a lot about it in the Senate, but you haven't much trouble in the Senate, more so, I guess, than you do in the House. Trying to, they said they're tax reform. We're all for tax reform. But, but every member has some problem with this bill. Warren Hussey, who drafts the bills for us, we had to meet with the Republican members about two weeks ago and they said, Tell us, can you draft the bill? He said, Well, I can do the framework along as you work. and. Uh, he said, I can give you a 25 cent bill in November. Bob Packwood says he, he must have it in September to get a bill out of the Senate. Bob Miller knows they don't think if he gets it then, they can get it out of the Senate. That's what they tell us privately. Uh, I think it's my duty to, to tell you this. And we've discussed it earlier with the Secretary that he can talk to the, to the Hussey and the people who draft the bills. But, uh, and Ross Kowski sits by me. He has he has a few problems with that. No. And and uh, joke. then the uh, certain tax he he'll have one problem one day, the next week he has the Oregon problems and others and, and uh, uh, you could see some long filibustering in the center from the state of New York. And uh, but we don't want you to think that we are trying to hold it up because we're working closely with the secretary and his staff. And, uh, but uh, we, we've, uh, we've had some very frank discussions around the table here this morning, but uh, uh, we don't want you disappointed because we're, we're with you and we want tax reform too, but uh, uh, just as much as the Senate does you, as they say, Bob's got a problem with all the Archie's got a problem with Ray McGrath from New York there, and he's... Maybe he's, I could he's, be... Uh, Ray's got a special problem. Maybe I could be as candid as I can. I, Appreciate, Mr. President, uh, you were saying that you were somewhat flexible on this. Uh, up to this point, uh, we haven't been as flexible as, as I think we could be on the, the issue of state and local taxes, which impacts, I think, probably disproportionately my uh, area more than perhaps anybody else's, but that's where I represent. Um, at this point in time, uh, to be very candid with you, I can't support this bill under any circumstance unless we we uh, we address that problem to some extent. Which, which problem? The state, state and local tax. And uh, I can tell you that if, if you're just beginning to hear about this as a problem now, uh, beginning this Friday and continuing every day until this is accomplished one way or another, you're going to hear about this. It's going to be a national coalition uh, formed uh, this week, and uh, there's going to be day-to-day -day operations uh, on this. So I, was, I would urge, if you uh, can be flexible at all on this particular part of the bill, that, that uh, you exercise that uh, flexibility. Yeah, it's probably already been said here today, maybe more than once. And if not, let me just remind you that more than two-thirds of the taxpayers presently do not deduct state and local taxes now. That the, the only ones were, again, here we are, Mr. Quinn talking about us with a tax bill for the, for the rich. Um, actually, the, uh, the only ones that, that benefit from that present deduction are those in the, in the top bracket. Well, I would, I would suggest that they perhaps should come down to Levittown and uh, see the 27 or 30,000 people who live there work in uh, defense plants around and make about $30,000. Uh, last Sunday when I was speaking at a commencement uh, of a high school in my district, there were maybe 5,000 people on a football field. And I was introduced to somebody who was trying to preserve the state and local uh, deduction, got a standing ovation from, from people who don't uh, make the kind of money that you're referring to. But Ray, in all fairness, I would doubt if those people really understood where they would be net. Everybody's against losing their state and local tax deduction in the abstract. If you tell somebody you're going to take the state and local tax deduction away from them, they're against it. 
I saw a poll that said that uh, the sanctity of, uh, of state and local deduction is the same as the sanctity of uh, the same numbers as the sanctity of, uh, of the uh, mortgage interest deduction on the first home. Well, Anna, look, do we have to look at this in one way? We talked for decades about tax simplification. We know that the present system is a Mickey Mouse arrangement by which actually the employees of the Internal Revenue Service can make it anything they want it to be. Uh, I well recall in Los Angeles some years ago when the regional director of IRS retired and then he went public with an interview that astounded the, everybody in the region when he told how they set a figure every year that was sent to him as to how much money they wanted from our district. And he was like a sales manager. He had to tell the fellows, you know, get this. And then when it was all in, he'd get another figure back that would tell him, after it was all in and reported, we want X number of dollars more from your district. So they sent agents out just to corral people where they thought it was available and uh, get into a thing that they were challenging, some of these deductions that were not as hard and fast as, as others. <coughs> All the things from business travel to uh, wardrobe, if you were in that kind of a business, things of that kind. And it revealed that, uh, hell, we don't have a tax system today that is hard and fast and that the individual knows exactly what the rules are. But in this one, as Jim says, I don't think these people have been told that if you're going to have the dream of lower rates, simplification, then you can't have a tax system that is made up of a, of a book full of, of deductions. But in return for those, you get a reduction in rate that leaves you better off than you were before. And you can't have both unless you're going for a tax cut. Well, Mr. President, uh, I, I hate to gag the members of the committee who are speaking on this uh, issue every day. But this has been a historical a, a deduction going back to the, to the Civil War. There have been quotes from the presidents of the United States that uh, we shouldn't uh, tax on tax. And it's been a historical deduction in our codes since 1913 when it was, was put in uh, based on uh, the philosophical double taxation argument. And uh, I think uh, I even saw some uh, rhetoric uh, some time back um, yourself regarding that particular issue. But the point is, it's very difficult for, uh, for uh, me to go back uh, to go back to my area and, and tell them they're going to they're lose it and then not have the certainty. Mm -hmm. Those rates can be adjusted at any time. Uh, you lose a deduction, you lose a deduction. Rates can be changed uh, every year. Every, every week is one. Well, the original basic dream of tax reform, and many people simplistically have gone shouting it, including members of the, of the Congress, and that was the flat rate, uh, just a, everybody pays like an agent's commission off gross income. Well, in that context, that deduction would have gone too. There would be no deductions if you had that. But we felt, and I think all of us agree, that you can't have that the other was uh, overly simple, that it could be harmful in such things as, that's why we kept the charitable deductions too. Our country, unlike almost any country in the world, has a tradition of the private sector, of volunteerism, and uh, we sure as hell don't want to discourage that or appear to substitute government for that, that volunteerism. So we, there were some things we, we kept. Some things we couldn't have the lowered rates um, and remain neutral if, if we kept them, uh, the deductions. And here was a deduction that, as I say, when we looked at it, only a third of the taxpayers or less um, were using or taking advantage of it. The others were paying. The two thirds are already paying a tax on <coughs> tax. The two thirds who don't itemize are already double taxed. Yes. Nobody's been complaining about that. Mr. President, if I could shift for a second. We got a lot of I could share for just one minute. I'd uh, like to say that many of us who are, who are um, for capital formation and for a strong economy 
believe, I personally believe, that a new tax bill, as the Secretary testified in his opening day, would reduce the cost of capital, would increase the GNP. You talked about your State of the Union address about how we were essentially diverting investment capital in this country from the new jobs of the future into tax shelters. We have a four-year supply of apartments and office buildings in my hometown because of the tax code, quite frankly. They've been sold to doctors and whatever as tax shelters, and that's where all the money's going. Prudential Base the other day advertised in Pittsburgh a 64 office story building that had a 52, for 52 to 1 return. If you provide $750, they gave you 41000 in tax deductions your first year in 1984. I'd like to see you begin to emphasize that a little more rather than how many dollars you're going to get reduced. I know the average taxpayer won't know how it's going to affect him, but a lot of people out there are looking at that amount of money and saying, that's all right, that amount to Hill of Beans. But the larger argument of what this is going to do to the future of our country and the growth of our country, to me, is far more important than how much we're going to do somebody's taxes or increase them. I really believe that's what we're trying to get to with this tax bill and would urge you to make a, a, a bigger point of that. I would like to tag on to what Henson said. I was going to make the same point and add one other thing to remember. Those one-third of the taxpayers that itemize pay over 70% of the taxes. And that's the reason this issue is as hot as it is. And I don't think we better overlook that. They're, they're the people that ninety percent of the contribution. They're the ones carrying the they're the ones carrying the load of all of understand. Maybe others around the table have got the same experience. I came from an industry in which they were paying self and youth money out in Hollywood. And I can tell you what it was like when the tax top tax bracket was ninety percent. Now most of Hollywood is freelance, including the crew camera people that grips the stagehands and all, they wait at home waiting, just like the actors do for a phone to ring and tell them to uh, uh, report to the studio, uh, making a picture and so forth, and tell them what the picture is. Well, after I made a couple of pictures, somebody come around with a script and I'd look at the part and I'd drool wanting to do the part. But for 10 cents on a dollar? And I'd say, hell no. Well now, maybe not me, but an awful lot of people in the star category, if they said no, the picture wasn't made. A Gary Cooper or some of that kind, it just wasn't made. So those other fellows, they sat at home and waited for the phone to ring. Well, I have to tell you, with all the deductions, and yeah, I tried to, I'd, I'd put some money in a wildcat oil lease and so forth. Oh, wait a minute, you bet that. I hoping that I could get something, something capital gains wise and so forth. And uh, never did, never worked out. But if you'd have told me then that by damn, I would be taxed, I wouldn't have any of those those tax breaks or anything to, to look at. But I'd get 65 cents out of every dollar. I would not only have been saying yes to that picture, I'd have been calling up people and asking if they didn't have another one. <laughs> On top of that, we're talking about any more that the most that anyone is ever going to have to pay out of the dollar they earn is 35 cents. And uh, you know, and Doug Flutie, I'll bet you, on our side <laughs> with that $7 million contract. Well, uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>